I'm Lynn. Welcome all of you to English Practice Channel. Today, we practice many listening lessons are called passive listening. Passive listening is how we get used to the native speaker's accent without focusing too much on the meaning of each word. It'll like the way we enjoy an English song with a clear melody. If we practice listening again and again, we will feel the sound and pronunciation. Now, we start our lesson. Exercise 1 Message 1 I've lost two credit cards. One is a Visa, the other is a MasterCard. What can I do? Don't worry. What's your name, please? My name is Ronald Howard. Howard, H-O-W-A-R-D. Do you know the numbers of the lost cards, sir? Yes, I wrote them down here. The visa is number 6091-1313-9781-0231. And the MasterCard is number 7228-6718. 7217-5059. Do you still remember the expiration date of the cards? Yes. The visa expires in November 2014. And the MasterCard in January 2015. Thank you, sir. Could you show me your ID card? Here you are. Thank you. Please come by the office on Wednesday so that we can issue two new cards. Message 2. Could you show me the menu, please? Here you are, sir. Will you dine a la carte or the table d'hôte? I think the table d'hôte will do very well for me. Does it include an appetizer, soup, and so forth? Yes, sir. The table d'hôte includes an appetizer, soup, salad, choice of dessert, tea, or coffee. Is there any particular dish you would recommend? The roast duck is very good tonight, and we also have several special chicken dishes if you like chicken. Okay. I'll take the roast duck and some veal. Do you want to drink something? A bottle of beer. Will you order your desserts now? Apple pie, ice cream, or cakes? Apple pie, please, and a cup of coffee. Okay. Wait a minute. I'll bring you the appetizer right away. Message. 3. Good morning, sir. Welcome to the Ambassador Hotel. Thank you. I've got a reservation through my secretary. My name is Reed. R-E-A-D-E. Just a minute, please. Yes, you've got a reservation. A single room for three days. The room number is 1201. Here is the key. Thank you. Could you show me your passport? Your passport number? Its number is JDA2151623. How many pieces of luggage do you have? Just these three, two suitcases and one bag. Okay. Please sign the register here, and the porter will take your luggage to your room. Here is the register. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I hope you'll enjoy your stay here. Exercise 2 Hi, Jenny. What are you doing down here? Oh, hello, Steve. Well, I'm trying to fill in this form, but I'm having a bit of a struggle as I sprained my wrist playing tennis yesterday. Don't worry. I'll do it for you. Let's have your pen. Right, fire away. Mm, let's see. I want to do the drama and theatre studies. I'd like to get the certificate. The course number is... Uh, 60201. No, sorry, 202. It seems to be on Thursday at 7.30. Yes, well, we don't have to put all that down. Now, I suppose we can call you Miss. Don't be funny. And spell my name right. Hmm. Well, if you'll have a name like Jenny McPherson... Let's see, it's M-A-C. No, big M, 
small c, no a. Right. M C P H E R S O N. Yes, okay. And don't forget it's a capital P, MacPherson. Now, what's your address? Well, I've just moved, so it's Six Westway Avenue, Longford. Hang on, don't go so fast. Six Westway Avenue, where? Longford. What's next? Your phone number, daytime and evening. Well, I've only got one, as we can't have calls at school in the daytime, so put down the evening one. 605-4829. 4829, OK. And you're a teacher. How old are you? 29? Mmm, wish I were. No, 32. Do they want my date of birth? No, don't seem to. Just age. How about educational qualifications? Well, I've got a degree in English literature and a diploma in media studies. Media studies, right. Now, have you ever done any of these extramural courses before? No, don't think so. Although I did do something on psychodrama once. But no, it wasn't extramural, was it? That seems to be it, except for the fee. Yes, well, that's the same for all the central courses. I think £25. I suppose I have to include it with this form. Looks like it. Uh, Do you want me to write the cheque out for you? But uh, you'll have to sign it. Exercise 3 There has been an armed robbery this morning at the Halifax Building Society's branch in Edward Street. John Brings is at the scene with Detective Sergeant Henry Lawson. Detective Sergeant, can you tell us what you know about the robbery? Yes, the raid took place this morning, shortly after 11.30, when a man accompanied by a woman went into the offices of the uh, building society and asked to see the manager. Uh, There were no other customers in the building at the time. They were let into the manager's office, and the woman produced a gun from her handbag. Then they took the manager back out of his office and made him tell the cashiers to hand over all the money they had in the tills and in the safe. Uh, it came to about $25,000. Presumably, you have a number of witnesses. Yes, uh, we have a good description of both of them. Uh, The man was about 1 metre 80 centimetres, around 35 years of age, with blue eyes and short curly red or ginger hair. He was wearing jeans, a green sweater and a three-quarter length blue coat. When he spoke to the cashier when he came in, he called himself Mr Erickson, but we doubt whether that is his real name. But we do know that may be his real name. He also spoke with a strong Scottish accent, which may help us to trace him. And what about the woman? Now, she is in her early twenties, slim and quite tall, about 1 metre 70 centimetres. She was wearing a long white raincoat, which was quite loose-fitting, and which she didn't take off. She had a beige handbag, which they used to hide the gun in, She's got straight, shoulder-length blonde hair, blue eyes, and, like the man, has a noticeable accent. Do you have any other information? Yes, the car they used was seen by two or three people. It's a blue or dark blue Ford Escort, and we have the registration number. And it's G595ERI. I'll say that again. It's G595ERI. Now, the car was stolen from Bishopstone just over a week ago, so if anyone has seen it in the last week, we would like to hear from them. We also know that the car's front left headlight was broken when it was stolen, and is still broken, we think. So, you would like information from the public about the car? Yes, and the people. We're appealing to anyone who thinks they may recognise the two robbers or know anything about the car. We've set up an incident room in Swindon and the telephone number is 774529. 
So we would like people to ring us if they have any information. Uh, and of course, all calls will be dealt with in the strictest confidence. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the number again, if you have any information, is double seven four five two nine. And now back to the studio. Exercise four. And now the results of our survey on spare time activities and sports. We wanted to know how people spend their spare time, so we interviewed women and men around the town during the whole of last week. Here's what we found out: only forty percent of men interviewed claimed to do some kind of physical exercise, while fifty percent of the women we talked to said that they follow a regular program of exercise. We also talked about watching sport on TV, and both groups claimed to spend some time on this. Forty-one percent of men interviewed do this, and thirty percent of women. We also wanted to find out exactly what form of exercise these people do. So we asked about different sports and activities. Jogging was by far the most popular, with twenty percent of men and eighteen percent of women. Most of them do this during the week, either in the morning before going to work or in the evening after work. Football was also popular with the men. Thirteen percent claim to play, mainly at the weekend on Saturdays. Not surprisingly, none of the women claim to play. Cricket was another popular sport among the men, with nineteen percent claiming to play. Again, no women mentioned this sport. A lot of people also said they took some form of exercise other than these team sports. Eighty percent of men and ninety percent of women said they regularly walked as a form of exercise, either as part of their daily routine to get to work or at the weekends in their spare time. Athletics was also mentioned, but not by many. Only ten percent of men said they did this. None of the women we spoke to mentioned it at all. Dancing was also mentioned as a form of exercise. Three percent of men and women mentioned this, and also yoga. Five percent of women said they did this regularly, and two percent of men. Finally, a small number of people included gardening as a form of exercise. Eleven percent of men said they did this, and thirteen percent of women. Exercise five. In earliest times, men considered lightning. To be one of the great mysteries of nature, some ancient people believed that lightning and thunder were the weapons of God. In reality, lightning is a flow of electricity formed high above the earth. A single flash of lightning, one point six kilometers long, has enough electricity to light one million light bulbs. The American scientist and statesman Benjamin Franklin. Was the first to show the connection between electricity and lightning in 1752. In the same year, he also built the first lightning rod. This device protects buildings from damage by lightning. Modern science has discovered that one stroke of lightning contains more than 15 million volts. A spark between a cloud and the Earth may be as long as thirteen kilometers, and travels at a speed of thirty million meters per second. Scientists estimate that there are about two thousand million flashes of lightning per year. Lightning hits the Empire State Building in New York City thirty to forty-eight times a year. In the United States alone. It kills an average of one person every day. The safest place to be in case of an electrical storm is in a closed car. Outside, one should go to low ground and not under trees. Also, one should stay out of water and away from metal fences. Inside a house. People should avoid opening doorways and windows, and not touch wires or metal things. With lightning, it is better to be safe 
than sorry. Exercise 6 These days, we know a lot about contaminated air, contaminated water and so on. We know that smoke, chemical substances and dust particles pollute our environment. We're not so familiar with the concept of pollution from noise and especially with its psychological effects. Generally, the physical effects are not surprising. Partial or complete deafness can result from excessive noises, airports, some factories, even some discos. But did you know that it's possible to kill a person with the right or wrong noise? Psychologists now believe that noise has a considerable effect on people's attitudes and behaviour. Experiments have proved that in noisy situations, even temporary ones, people behave more irritably and less cooperatively. In more permanent noisy situations, many people cannot work hard and they suffer from severe anxiety and instability as well as other psychological problems. However, psychologists distinguish between sound and noise. Sound is measured physically in decibels. Noise cannot be measured in the same way because it refers to the psychological effect of sound and its level of intensity depends on the situation. Thus, for passengers at an airport who expect to hear aeroplanes taking off and landing, there may be a lot of sound but not much noise. That is, they're not bothered by the noise. By contrast, if you're at a concert and two people behind you are whispering, you feel they're talking noisily, even if there is not much sound. You notice the noise because it affects you psychologically. Both sound and noise can have negative effects. But what is important is if the person has control over the sound. People walking down the street with stereo earphones listening to music that they enjoy are receiving a lot of decibels of sound, but they're probably happy hearing sounds which they control. On the other hand, people in the street without stereo earphones must tolerate a lot of noise which they have no control over. It is noise pollution that we need to control in order to help people live more happily. Exercise 7 Now, Mr. Wilson, we'd like to ask you a few questions about the robbery you witnessed the Tuesday before last, the 15th of September. Oh, but I had an interview with one of your officers the day after. Yes, sir, I'm aware of that. But there are still one or two little details we'd like to get absolutely clear. So if you don't mind... Oh, not at all. I I'm glad to help. What would you like to know? Well, sir, first of all, we'd like to know the registration number of the Ford Fiesta. The number you gave us on the 16th was YEA610J. Are you absolutely sure that was the correct registration? Gosh, I can't remember the exact registration now. I mean, it was ten days ago. Um... Yes, I do remember thinking, that's easy, it almost looks like year. And I'm sure the last letter was J for Jimmy. That's my name, you know. But the numbers, well, I've no idea now, really. You see, Mr. Wilson, we had another witness who told us the numbers were 601, not 610. Oh, dear. Um, all I can say is I gave you the numbers that I thought I saw at the time. OK, Mr Wilson. Can you go over the events as you remember them? Um, I, uh, I was on my way home from the chemist's. It was about 25 to 6. I just bought some cough mixture for my little boy and... How can you be sure about the time? Well, I'd just been to the chemist, as I say, and I remember saying to the girl, Well, I suppose you must be glad the day's over. And she said, Oh, no, not today. We do normally shut at 5.30, but it's our late night tonight, unfortunately. 
We don't shut till a quarter to eight, so another two and a quarter hours to go. So it was five thirty-five. Yes, and just as I was going to cross the road, I saw two men run out of the pub opposite, jump into the red Ford Fiesta, and drive off at top speed. There was a driver already in the car waiting for them, of course. So there were three of them altogether. Yes, and we found out that one of the barmen in the pub was the one who organised it all. He handed the money over to the two blokes who went into the pub. Ah, so you've arrested them all now? All but one, sir. That's why evidence could be crucial. Exercise eight. Do you know what, Tom? It won't be long before we'll all be travelling to space in a cable car. A cable car? What do you mean? A sort of sky lift? Well, yes, I suppose so. You must be joking. Where on earth did you get that idea from? Oh, I've just been reading it in a book called Apes to Astronauts by Adrian Berry. He's the science correspondent of the Daily Telegraph, so he should know what he's talking about. He says, "Wait a minute, I've got it here, page twenty-eight. A cable car to the heavens." Oh, honestly, Jane, you surely don't believe all that stuff you read in those sci-fi books? It's not science fiction; it's a fact. Hang on. I read you what he says. The space writer Arthur C. Clarke, to whose inspiration we owe the communications satellite, recently outlined a proposal for a new means of space travel, which he admitted is so outrageous that many of you may consider it not even science fiction but pure fantasy. Shall I go on? No, just tell me how he thinks it could be done. Well, it sounds quite simple, really. One end of a cable, twenty-three thousand miles long. How long? Twenty-three thousand miles. Do listen. One end of a cable, twenty-three thousand miles long, would be attached to a point on the Earth's equator, and the other to a satellite in geostationary orbit. So, the cable would be absolutely tight between the two points, and the elevator would. Travel up and down, carrying people and freight. According to Arthur Clarke, it's the only way to travel in space without using rocket engines, which would make it much more economical. I wonder if it would be more comfortable. It sounds pretty uncomfortable to me, and heaven knows what speed it'd be travelling at.、Uh, what would happen if the cable broke? Oh, he explains all that. Apparently, the most likely place for it to break would be at or near the ground, and if that happened, it wouldn't fall down; it would fall upwards. Upwards? Hmm. Yes, I suppose it would. Yes. Sounds funny, doesn't it? Something falling upwards. Anyway, it wouldn't matter too much either if the cable broke away from the high end. It would remain rigid until it could be reattached to the satellite. I don't quite see why. Well, it would be the pull of gravity from above. Anyway, who'd want to be stuck in an elevator attached to a rigid cable thousands of miles up in space? I suppose he doesn't say what would happen if it broke in the middle. Actually, he does. He says it would be dangerous if the break occurred at any altitude up to fifteen thousand miles, because the bit attached to the Earth would, what does he say? Oh yes, collapse and wrap itself around the equator like a whiplash. Whiplash, you know, the long bit of cord or leather on a whip. Anyway, even that would only be really catastrophic if the cable was made of steel or some other metal. Metals are much too heavy. The cable would have to be made of some material capable of suspension without snapping. But I thought you said the cable would be twenty-three thousand miles long. I did, but the three thousand mile breaking length is because of gravity. Well, all I can say is you'll never catch me going to space in a cable car. I'd rather keep my feet on the ground. Thank you very much. Exercise nine.
Man has always been interested in apes because they are at the same time so like him and so unlike him. In their basic anatomy or body structure, they are very similar, and for this reason, they are both classified as primates, the highest form of animal. They also resemble each other in having hands and feet instead of claws like cats or hooves like horses. Likewise, neither has a tail. Both men and apes have large brains compared to their body size, and this helps again to distinguish them from other species of animals. But compared to the chimpanzee, for example, man's brain is four times as large. Like man, apes can use tools. For example, an ape may pick up a stick. And put it in an ant's nest to make the ants come out. Similarly, apes have been known to make tools. For example, by breaking off branches to use as sticks. Man, however, is quite different. In fact, unique among animals because he can make a plan and then make a tool by following that plan. All human beings everywhere have a language, and there are thousands of different languages in the world. All these languages are equally complex, and they are very different from the cries of apes and other animals. Finally, we can use fire making to differentiate men from apes. Man has possessed the secret of making fire for thousands of years. In contrast. Neither apes nor any other animals possess this secret. Exercise ten. Do UFOs really exist? This question divides people into two sharply opposing camps: the believers and the non-believers. The former is quite convinced that extraterrestrials exist and travel around the universe in flying saucers. The non-believers are sure that the only form of life exists here on Earth, and that any UFO sightings can be scientifically explained as purely terrestrial phenomena. So let's take the believers first and see what evidence they have to support their belief. For many years, there have been reports of strange flying objects. And in 1947, the name of unidentified flying objects, or UFOs, was given to these phenomena. Many of the reports of UFOs have a curious similarity. The objects are generally described as disc or cigar-shaped. In daylight, they appear silvery, often luminous, or surrounded by an aura. At night, they have the appearance of bright lights, often yellow-red in color. They are said to travel at high speed and accelerate rapidly, frequently disappearing suddenly. A sound described as a low hum or swish has been heard when the UFOs appear, and they sometimes stop and hover or rotate over certain spots, as though observing something. These reports have come from all types of people: policemen, farmers, walkers, aircraft pilots, children, housewives. In fact, no one class can be selected as being particularly susceptible to sightings. Perhaps, though, the most convincing evidence has come from the aircraft pilots, whose visual sightings have been supported by radar tracking. Most radar operators have compared the UFOs on their radar screens to large aircraft, though they have an unexpected manner of simply vanishing, unlike a normal aircraft. Certain photographic evidence of UFOs has also been produced, although many of the prints are unclear or blurred. But the most astonishing reports have been of close encounters with UFOs. Dr. Heineck, 
director of the Center for UFO Studies in Illinois, USA, has classified these encounters as of three kinds. A close encounter of the first kind is when a witness reports seeing a UFO within a few hundred meters, often when it has landed on the ground. A close encounter of the second kind is when the UFO has left a physical trace, such as an indentation or scorching of the ground, a burnt area of vegetation or broken telephone wires or tree branches. A close encounter of the third kind is when people report actual contact with alien beings. Here, the descriptions vary widely from reports of normal-looking humans, generally wearing unusual clothes or speaking a strange language, to those little green men with four legs. This third kind of encounter is the most difficult to believe in, although many of the witnesses appear to be sensible men and women not given to lying. From all the different kinds of report, there seems to emerge a general pattern of UFOs. There is a high level of agreement on the shape, colour, movement and sound of UFOs, but far less coherence when describing extraterrestrial beings. To the non-believers... They don't exist. In fact, the non-believers state quite categorically that all UFOs have a scientific explanation. They are either natural phenomena, such as ball lightning, marsh gas, comets, or northern lights, or they are aircraft seen from an unusual angle. Non-believers also suggest UFOs might be planes or rockets which are on government secret lists and therefore of designs unknown to the public. They discount the evidence of radar sightings as the screens sometimes show up radar shadows or mirages of things which do not exist. Photographs are dismissed as fakes or as pictures of aircraft taken from unusual angles. Finally, the three types of close encounters are discounted by the non-believers as hoaxes, hallucinations, or people misinterpreting information. The first kind of encounter can be accounted for in the same way as a flying saucer seen in the air, as a natural phenomenon. The second kind of encounter usually has a natural cause, the heat marks resulting from fires caused by lightning or people's carelessness, the telephone wires and branches being blown down by high winds, and the indentations resulting from subsidence of the land. The third kind of encounter is generally disbelieved because no photographic or taped evidence exists. It is also felt that the witnesses may have been suffering from abnormal mental or physical states at the time. So, to sum up, it is very difficult to say whether UFOs definitely exist or not. The evidence for their existence is rather weak. But on the other hand, there are certain strange phenomena which cannot be explained scientifically at the moment. Perhaps we can leave the subject with a quote from Dr. Hynek. Maybe the whole phenomenon is not as mysterious as we think. After all, a hundred years ago, we knew nothing about nuclear energy. Maybe our scientific knowledge is just not advanced enough to explain UFOs. In the meantime, reports will continue to pour into the Center for UFO Studies and spotters all over the world will continue to watch the skies for signs of man from outer space. Exercise 11 I consider friendship to be one of the most important things in life, whatever your status, married or single. I see too many lonely people around. A lot of us get so involved with material values, family problems, keeping up with the Joneses, etc., that we forget the real meaning of friendship. Which is what, according to you? 
They say a friend in need is a friend indeed, which is partly true. But a real friend should also be able to share your happy moments without feeling jealous. A good friendship is one where you can accept and forgive him, understand mood, and don't feel hurt if a friend doesn't feel like seeing you. Of course, honesty is an essential part of any relationship. We should learn to accept our friends for what they are. As a married man, do you find your friendship is only with other men? Of course not. Both my wife and I have men and women friends, thank goodness. Although family life is fulfilling, it isn't enough. Both my wife and I get tremendous satisfaction from our friends, married or single, male and female. And we both have our separate friends too. We'd get bored with each other if we had the same friends. You must have a full life. We certainly do. And as I say, our friendship gives us a lot of pleasure. After all, friends should not be people with whom you kill time. Real friendship, in my opinion, is a spiritually developing experience. I've never had a lot of friends. I've never regarded them as particularly important. Perhaps that's because I come from a big family, two brothers and three sisters, and lots of cousins. And that's what's really important in my family. If you really need help, you get it from your family, don't you? Well, at least that's what I've always found. What about you, Jean? To me, friendship, having friends, people I know I can really count on. To me, that's the most important thing in life. It's more important even than love. If you love someone, you can always fall out of love again, and that can lead to a lot of hurt feelings, bitterness and so on. But a good friend is a friend for life. And what exactly do you mean by a friend? Well, I've already said, someone you know you can count on. I suppose what I really mean is, let's see, how am I going to put this? It's someone who will help you if you need help, who will listen to you when you talk about your problems, someone you can trust. What do you mean by a friend, Robert? Who likes the same things that you do? Who you can argue with and not lose your temper, even if you don't always agree about things. I mean, someone who you don't have to talk to all the time, but can be silent with, perhaps. That's important, too. You can just sit together and not say very much sometimes. Just relax. I don't like people who talk all the time. Are you very good at keeping in touch with your friends if you don't see them regularly? No, not always. I've lived in lots of places, and to be honest, once I move away, I often do drift out of touch with my friends. And I'm not a very good letter writer either. Never have been. But I know that if I saw those friends again, if I ever moved back to the same place, or for some other reasons, we got back into close contact again, I'm sure the friendship would be just as strong as it was before. Several of my friends have moved away, got married, things like that. One of my friends has had a baby recently, and I'll admit, I don't see or hear from her as much as I used to. She lives in another neighborhood, and when I phone her, she always seems busy. But that's an exception. I write a lot of letters to my friends and get a lot of letters from them. I have a friend I went to school with, and ten years ago she emigrated to Canada. But she still writes to me every month, and I write to her just as often. Exercise 12 Tower Bridge is located in one of the most interesting parts of London. On either top of the tower, you can get a bird's eye view of the wonderful scenery all round Tower Bridge. On its south side are many tall old buildings. On its north side stands the Tower of London itself. But Tower Bridge, the first bridge over the Thames, as you travel to London from the sea, is the most famous of them all.
Although they look the same age, the tower is almost a thousand years old, and Tower Bridge, which was built in the 1890s, is just over 100. Because of the tall ships up and down the Thames, it was proposed in 1850 that a bridge across the Thames near the tower was most necessary. However, the designers argued about the new bridge for about 30 years. They took so long because they had two big problems. One is that the new bridge must look like the old tower, and the other is that the bridge must not look like a modern bridge. They made it look like the old tower, so everyone was happy. Besides, the most surprising thing about Tower Bridge is that it opens in the middle while big ships are going through to the Pool of London. If you're lucky enough to see the bridge with its two opening arms high in the air, you'll never forget it. The bridge took eight years to build and cost £900,000, a lot of money in those days. But it was a wonderful success and became a famous tourist attraction in London on the day when the bridge was completed. A hundred years ago, the Thames was once London's busiest traffic route, so that the bridge opened at least 12 times a day. Today, big ships don't go so far up the Thames. Tower Bridge opens perhaps only twice a week, but the same wonderful machinery is still in good condition. Green, yellow and red, the colourful wheels and engines look smart and new, not a hundred years old. They still lift the two heavy opening arms, each 1,000 tonnes, leaving 70 metres for the ships to go through. And they still can open and close the bridge in one and a half minutes. Things are changing greatly now at Tower Bridge. The horses that used to help with pulling have gone, and so have the tugs, for they are no longer necessary. The walkways from one tower to the other at the top of the bridge were closed years ago because so many people jumped off them into the Thames, which is said to open again soon. In addition, the beautiful wheels will be part of a special exhibition for the public to visit. There'll be a restaurant in one of the towers and a pub in the other. But whatever happens in its exciting future, Tower Bridge will always mean London. Exercise 13 uh, Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, good morning. We'd like to book a holiday for July, please. Certainly. Uh, where did you have in mind? Oh, well, we haven't thought a lot about it, really. We'd just like to go somewhere hot, you know. And it must be in July. I see. Well, let's get the dates cleared up first, then we can see about availability. What part of July were you thinking of? Ah, oh, well, you see, we have slightly different holidays. I've got the whole month except for the last four days, so I could go from the 1st to the 27th. But my friend here doesn't start until the 7th, so I suppose it will have to be in the middle two weeks, really. Yes, but I've got to be back by the 24th. OK. Now let's find a destination. Any preferences? Spain? Greece? Portugal? Oh, not Spain. We went there last year and it was absolutely packed with teenagers making noise and getting drunk all the time. Yes, it was terrible. We definitely want somewhere quieter this year. Well, of course, it depends more on the resort rather than the country. There are resorts in every country which cater for the family or the slightly older person. They're usually a shade more expensive, though, as you might expect. Oh, well, we don't mind paying a bit more if it means more peace and quiet, do we? Definitely not. It'd be well worth it. All right, let's have a look at what we've got on the computer. July. Uh, was it 10 or 14 nights you wanted? Oh, the fortnight, please. Right. Well, let's start with Italy. Um, we've got 14 nights bed and breakfast in Sorrento for £345 from Manchester on the 14th, 
Or we've got... No, wait a minute. That's no good for me. We wouldn't get back till the 28th, and I've got to be back at work before that. Ah, uh, yes. Um, how about Opatidia? Uh, two weeks half bored. Where's that? Yugoslavia, madam. Uh, northern part. Nice little place. Uh, that would be £310, from Manchester again. Yugoslavia? Oh, but I've been told the beaches aren't very nice there. Well, again, it depends on where you go. In Opatidia, uh, they have those big wooden platforms, you know, with some bits. So there's no beach as such, but the water is beautifully clean and... Oh, no. I think we prefer a real beach. You know, I like a bit of sand. <laughs> huh. All right. How about Greece? The Greek islands. We have several holidays there. Spetsa, Kos, departures every Tuesday. And it's quite economical, really, because it's all on a self-catering basis. So? Oh, what about hotels? We'd prefer to be in a nice hotel, I think. What about you, Kath? Oh, yes. I can't be bothered with cooking your own meals and all that sort of thing. I like to forget about all that when I go on holiday. Hmm. Well, I'm afraid it's all self-catering we do for the Greek islands. How about the mainland? There's a dual centre holiday here, Athens and Delphi. Seven days in each. That would come to... Oh, just a minute. Isn't it a bit sweltering in Athens at that time of year? Well, it's not exactly the coldest place in Europe. <laughs> Let's see. The average temperature in July is 29 centigrade. That's 81 Fahrenheit. Oh, God, no. I think we'd just die in all that heat. I mean, the coast's bad enough, but in a city. All right, let's try somewhere else. How about Portugal? Oh, that sounds great. We've never been there, have we? Let's see now. We've got 14 nights in Albufeira, half board from Gatwick, for £385. Albufeira? Oh, wait a minute. Did you say the flight was from London? Oh, well, really, we'd prefer a flight from the north somewhere. Manchester, perhaps. Or even Glasgow. Right. There's a 12-night holiday in Lagos, that's near Albufeira, from Manchester on the 11th, for £455. Oh, that's a bit pricey, isn't it? Why is it so much more than the other one? Well, madam, there's a surcharge for the airport, and it's a five-star hotel. Oh, well, it's a bit over our budget, really. Thank you to practice with me. See you next lesson.